Good morning. Uh, we are in a new series called This Changes Everything. And as Paula reminded us this morning, we know what the this is. Let's fill in the blank. What is this? Spring? No, that's, that's not it. Uh, it's a good guess, though. It does change a lot of things. Spring does change a lot of things. It's the resurrection of Jesus that changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus changes how we look at the world, what we believe about life, and how we act. Uh, last week, uh, we looked at how encountering Jesus changes everything. We talked about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus and how they abruptly changed direction. They were headed out of town to uh, a town called Emmaus. And then in the middle of the night, they decided to make a seven mile trek back to Jerusalem to be with the other disciples. So they literally turned around, physically turned around. And of course, we saw that Jesus took the time to walk with those two disciples so that they would experience the joy of his resurrection. Uh, two weeks ago, we looked at the empty tomb and we saw how the women who came to the tomb to anoint the uh, dead body of Jesus had their very mission changed because of the resurrection of Jesus. So this morning, if you want to uh, turn with me, you can turn to John chapter 21. We'll get there in a minute. Uh, this morning, we'll be looking at another resurrection appearance of Jesus. And this morning, we're going to find Jesus, the risen Jesus, on a mission of reconciliation with one of his most faithful and famous disciples, the uh, Apostle Peter. So that's why I've called this mission reconciliation. He's, uh, Jesus is on a mission of reconciliation. I want to ask you, though, before we get into the text, have you ever had a moment when you let down someone who was close to you? Maybe you promised to do something and you didn't do it. Uh, or maybe you, your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend thought you were going to be with them forever and that's not what, how it worked out. Uh, please don't go trying to track down my ex-girlfriends and ask them that question. Um, <laughs> And, you know, Zach is, my brother is in the room today, so please, Zach, don't, you know, laundry list all the things that I've let you down over life. Uh, he's got a long list. Uh, look, I, I'd like to think that I'm a faithful, responsible friend, uh, but I know that I've done that. I've let people down before. I've got one specific example I'm thinking of this morning. Uh, about 13 or 14 years ago, uh, we had two friends of ours, a couple uh, named Rick and Stephanie Canfield, and they were planning on flying out of town on a Saturday morning. And they were going to, I think, like Aruba or someplace like far, far away. It was a really great trip. And they had arranged with me a couple weeks in advance to take them to the airport at like 6 a.m. on Saturday morning. So 6 a.m. Saturday morning, I'm supposed to take them to the airport. Well, between the time they asked me and the time that morning came around, I had totally forgotten that I told them I was going to take them to the airport at 6 a.m. in the morning, and for whatever reason, I usually didn't do this, but I turned my phone on Do Not Disturb. I had an old flip phone back then. And uh, so the morning comes, and I sleep in like I you know, sometimes did on Saturday morning. Wake up at 8 or 9, and I open my phone, and what do you think? I had like five missed calls. I had a ton of texts from this couple being like, hey, we think you're coming, right? You're coming, you're coming. And then, nope, you're not coming. We're calling a cab. Um, and, you know, Good news was they made it to the airport on time without my help. So good for Rick and Stephanie. They figured it out. They didn't, they didn't need me after all. Um, the bad news was, can you imagine how I felt having promised to them, I'm going to take you to the airport. I wake up. I see all these texts and these missed calls, and I had screwed up. Um, so they were gone, like I said, far away, like Aruba, for like a week or a week and a half or something. So I probably didn't see them for a couple weeks. Can you imagine what it felt like for me the first time I saw them after that happened? The first time I saw them after that happened, I made a beeline to them and immediately apologized profusely. Immediately told them, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I can't, you know, can't believe. And they were like, and you know what the cool thing about it was is they were, they had already forgiven me. They had already forgiven me. And so it made that process of reconciliation so much easier. But I'll tell you that even though they immediately forgave me, I still had a hard time moving on. Even after they forgave me, I had a hard time moving on because I felt like I had let them down. So we're going to think about this in light of, of Jesus and Peter this morning. In John chapter 21, uh, we're just going to walk through this record slowly and we'll talk about it. John chapter 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias or the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Then it lists the people who were there. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, 
Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. I love the fact that this chapter begins with the word revelation. Uh, the word revelation is going to be important for us this morning because what Jesus is going to do this morning is reveal more of himself to his disciples. And because this was written down for us in the Gospel of John, he's going to reveal more of himself to us this morning. He's going to show them that he is alive, but more importantly than that, he's going to show them an important aspect of who he is and what he's about. Verse 3, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got the boat, and, uh, but that night they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Uh, before we keep going, I think it's important to say that I don't put too much uh, stock in observing what the disciples were doing. Some scholars have said, well, maybe they shouldn't have been fishing. Maybe they should have been, you know, back in Jerusalem or doing what Jesus told them to do. Um, some scholars say, well, you know, maybe they were just trying to pay the bills and Jesus did tell them to meet them in Galilee. You know, who knows what's going on here? The point is, they go fishing and it was unsuccessful. Verse 5, Jesus said to them, children, do you have any fish? They answered him, no. And he said to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. Now I want to point out that uh, these men were skilled fishermen. Uh, we know that Peter was a skilled fisherman. We know that the sons of Zebedee were both skilled fishermen. Uh, before they met Jesus, they made a living fishing. Uh, now, most of them, at least the ones that are named, we know are from this part of the world. They're from the area around the Sea of Galilee. So not only do they know how to fish, they know how to fish in this particular lake, okay? So yet, and they don't know who this is, but some stranger has the gall to call to them from the shore and be like, hey, bros, you should be fishing on this side of the boat, not that side of the boat. So this is, this is interesting. This is something weird is going on here. And I think we're, this, this should remind us of Luke chapter 5, where a similar thing happened. And that moment in Luke chapter 5 is when Peter left everything to follow Jesus. He left his nets, he left the fish, he left everything to follow Jesus in a very similar account. So what we're seeing here already is that Jesus is taking Peter back. He's taking Peter back to where it all began for him. Verse 7. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the, the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came into the boat, uh, in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. So finally, the disciple who loved Jesus and, and who Jesus loved, he recognizes that this is the resurrected Jesus. So Peter, he has his outer cloth unfastened to do the work in the boat. He wraps his cloth around him, and, he, and like impetuous sort of Peter does, he jumps just straight into the water, doesn't think twice, just jumps in the water, starts heading towards Jesus. Uh, sometimes, uh, like this word stripped, for example, in verse 7, you know, it's sometimes as he was naked in other translations or whatever. Uh, the point is, is that this outer garment that Peter was wearing is usually worn over other clothing. There's usually other clothing. But Peter, for whatever reason, was just wearing the outer garment over nothing. So he had to wrap himself and make sure he was decent before he goes and sees his Lord. Now, I want to think for a second about what Peter's going through emotionally. And the Bible doesn't tell us exactly, but I think we can take some guesses about what Peter is feeling. Um, to provide a little bit of context, the last time... Um, one of the last times that Peter and Jesus had a full conversation, Jesus told Peter that Peter was going to deny him three times. And Peter says, look, I'm not going to deny you. I'm, waiting to I'm willing to die for you. I will do whatever you need me to do. You know, Peter goes out of his way to say, that's not true. I'm going to be with you no matter what happens. I'm going to be right by your side, Jesus. And um, it's interesting because what happens after that is, when Jesus gets arrested, they all flee. Uh, Peter sort of trails behind and watches everything. And by the time the, clock, the, the uh, rooster crows three times, Peter denies Jesus just like Jesus said he was going to. Three times. So imagine that the last time you really had a conversation with Jesus, uh, you told him, look, man, I'm not going to deny you. 
And then all of a sudden, you know, probably a week or maybe more later, you, you have another opportunity to see Jesus. And you're walking in, out of the water toward the shore where Jesus is. I imagine he was feeling sort of like I was feeling when I saw that couple a couple weeks after I, I betrayed them, right? By not remembering to take them to the airport. So my guess is Peter's feeling shame. I'm guessing he's feeling guilt. I'm guessing that he uh, is excited on some level to see Jesus, but he's also nervous about what this encounter is going to bring. Um, so there's probably a mixture of emotions going on here. Let's read verse 9 now. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid out on it and bread. Apparently, Jesus didn't have trouble finding fish, so <laughs> he already had fish going on. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Uh, what I want to point out here about this section is this word charcoal fire. This detail about the charcoal fire is fascinating uh, because uh, it, you may not know this right now, but I'm going to tell you that there's only two times that this word is used in Scripture. It's used in this verse right here. The other time that we see it is in John chapter 18. So let's, I'm going to turn there real briefly. If you want to keep a finger here in John 21, you can, but we're going to go to John 18 for just one second. John 18, verse 15 Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest, but Peter stood outside at the door. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, You also are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I'm not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. So they're all warming themselves at a charcoal fire. This is the only other time in scripture where this word is used. Verse 20, 25, now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear, ear Peter had cut off asked, did I not see you in the guard with him? Peter again denied it and at once a rooster crowed. So here, in the moment when Peter is denying his Lord, just like the Lord said he was going to, one of the things that's present is a charcoal fire. And we know that memories are tied to smells and tied to experiences. And, and in one of the Gospels, it says that right when he denied Jesus the third time, Jesus, who's being moved back and forth for different trials, looks at Peter. So do you think, I'm just going to pause this real quick, do you think that Peter remembered what happened the last time he was at a charcoal fire? <laughs> do you think that the look, the feel, the smell, the ambiance took him back a couple weeks in time? Do you think it brought back a happy memory <laughs> or this memory? I think we can presume that Peter has some shame and grief going on here. Back in John chapter 21, verse 12, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and so with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. So Jesus uh, serves his disciples breakfast. They know who he is. And then the, we'll continue on in the record here in a moment. But before we read the rest of the chapter, I want to sort of uh, sum up what we've seen so far and make our first point, which is um, disciples, as, as Anna pointed out, the disciples have been through a lot. The disciples have been through a lot. Can you imagine walking with Jesus, this man who is kinder and more wise and just unbelievable in so many respects, and you, you've dedicated your whole lives to following him. You think that he's the Messiah. He's going to help throw off Rome, and he's going to help Israel become a world power again, and God's with us, and he's going to help us, and we're going to do this amazing thing. And then, instead of all of that happening, what happens is he dies. And not just dies, he dies this terrible, terrible death on the cross. And so, Anna, I think, is right to, was that right to point out to us last week that these people have been through trauma. Like, we can understand this. They've been through some traumatic things. 
And so it's natural for us to understand that the relationship between Jesus and his disciples have changed because this trauma has changed them. This trauma has changed them. Crucifixion and death has changed things. They're not going to relate to Jesus the same way that they did before. And of course, we know, because we know the end of the story, that Jesus is going to ascend and leave them. He's already told them that that's what's going to happen. But he's going to ascend and leave them. And so their relationship is not going to be the same. They're not going to be walking around Galilee or walking around Jerusalem with him anymore. So crucifixion and death does change things. We have to understand this. But what Jesus is setting out with this appearance is to show that even though his death, his crucifixion has changed things, that reconciliation is still possible. And there's a reason that reconciliation is still possible. Reconciliation is still possible because of his resurrection. That's what makes it possible. So let's just think about the whole, the whole passage we've read to this point. I, I submit to you this whole thing was supernaturally devised and supernaturally executed. In normal circumstances, these men were professional fishermen fishing at their home, their home lake. They knew how to fish in this lake. So the idea that they would go all night without catching fish is pretty weird. Like, these are professional fishermen in their home lake. That's sort of bizarre to begin with. Now, the idea that Jesus could just tell them, hey, just take the net that's on this side and throw it on the other side, and that, that would all just work out. Uh, yeah, that's also weird. That's also really bizarre, okay, that they would just get like this massive hole that's literally right under their nose. Like, this is all very strange. But there's all these things that we can think about in this passage, but the one thing I want to point out and focus on is the fact that Jesus is teaching them yet again the importance of relationship with him. He's showing them that, look, you fished all night with, on your own strength, on your own ability, doing what you could do naturally. And then I come along, and all of a sudden, this is what happens. Success. And he's about to, and he's going to continue reconciling all of them back to him, especially Peter. He's focused on Peter. And what he's doing is he's, he's trying to teach them what he taught them in John 15. He's trying to teach them to abide in the vine. So again, my point is that there is a sense in which the crucifixion has changed things. The, the disciples feel bad for being afraid and hiding. Uh, you know, there's probably guilt and shame, not just on Peter's part, but on these other disciples' part. And what Jesus is again teaching them is that, yes, the crucifixion changed things. Our relationship won't be the same anymore. It is different. Things will be different. We should acknowledge that there are doubts, there are fears, there's brokenness here in this record. These men are experiencing these things. But even more than the crucifixion changes things, resurrection changes things. And because of the resurrection, the disciples had this opportunity to be reconciled back into relationship with Jesus. They have a chance now to not end the story with the doubts and the fears and the brokenness and the loss. The story can now end in a different place. It can end with victory. So now, with that in hand, let's keep reading and look at how Peter reconciles with Jesus. Verse 15. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. These are some other details that scholars debate on how important it should be. There's different words for like feed and tend. There's different words for sheep here. Uh, there's different words for love going on. And I'm not super dogmatic either way, but this morning I'm just going to sort of assume that these are all synonyms, that we can just sort of think of this as three you know, repetitions. We've read the first two. We'll get to the third one here in a second. And Jesus asked Peter a difficult question. He asked them, uh, Peter, do you love me more than these? Uh, we don't know if he's talking about the fish or if he's talking about the other disciples. Do you love me more than you do fishing? Do you love me more than these other disciples love me? Um, probably he's talking about the other disciples, but it's, it's hard to know for sure. And it's really interesting that Peter doesn't answer this question with a yes or no. He doesn't say like yes or no. He says, 
you know that I love you. He sort of like circumvents the question. He's like, you know that I love you. You know that I love you. In response to this, Jesus asked Peter to shepherd the flock. In verse 16, Jesus asked Peter a similar question. Do you love me? He drops them more than these. And Peter gives an almost identical reply. And Jesus asked him again to tend his sheep. Verse 17, he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. So Peter's grieved because Jesus keeps asking this question over and over again. And Peter's like, man, look, I've already told you. You already know this. I love you. Let's move on. Let's talk about something else. You know? <laughs> Verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So I've always wondered, like, why do these two verses follow the three verses we just read? Like, why is, why is Jesus all of a sudden talking about, like, growing old and not being able to control what you're doing? And, and then, thankfully, uh, it looks like John, the narrator, gives us, like, this, like, sentence about, this is about Peter's death in the future, Okay. So we, we get some help here, which is really good. So like, what is going on here? Why, why is Jesus talking to Peter about his death during this, this conversation that's about reconciliation? Well, I think first it's important to remember the context here. The last time Peter was at a charcoal fire, he was denying Jesus. How many times did he deny Jesus? He denied him three times. Now, how many times... Does Jesus ask the question, Peter, do you love me? Three times. So what's happening here is Jesus is taking Peter back to where it all began so that he can say, let's go back to square one, Peter. Let's start back at the beginning. I called you from fishing to fish men. I called you from your common background to serve me and to serve me as a disciple, as a close one who would be in my presence and around me and working with me and leading the people. And he's saying, two, three, you denied me. Let's undo those. Three, two, one. Let's go back to the beginning. So in some sense, we can say that this is Peter's commissioning. I think it's probably better to call it a recommissioning because Peter's been called before. He's been called one of the 12 uh, Jesus has given him several pretty high, exalted things to look forward to in his ministry before this. And yet Peter here is emotionally in a spot where he doesn't believe any of that anymore. He's not sure what's up and what's down. And Jesus has taken him back to the beginning and saying, yes, I still am choosing you. So Jesus is here on a mission to reconcile with Peter. And Peter, here in this moment, is stepping up for good. In the Gospel of John, Jesus says that the good shepherd is the one who lays his life down for the sheep. That's John 10, 11. Uh, Jesus has already done that. Later in the Gospel of John, Peter says, I will lay down my life for you. That's John 13, 37. But instead of laying down his life for him, and by the way, John 13 is the last night before you know, Jesus is betrayed. This is like at the end of his ministry. It's like halfway through the gospel of John, but it's at the very end of Jesus' ministry. So Peter, like weeks before, has told Jesus, I will die for you. I'll lay my life down for you. He didn't do that. Instead, he ran away. Instead, he denied. So what Jesus is now explaining to Peter through this recommissioning is that Peter will actually do what he promised in John 13. He will lay down his life for Jesus. It just wasn't that first time. Jesus is telling him, look, you're going to do it, but it's going to be, it's going to be later. That's why he says these things here. Because Peter, what's in Peter's mind is what he promised Jesus. What he failed to do. And Jesus is telling him during his recommissioning, look, man, you are going to be able to do it. You're going to accomplish it. So one day, Peter is going to die for the sake of the gospel. That's what Jesus is telling him here. What's cool about this is Jesus transitions from that to 
don't worry about this right now because what does he close with? He closed with the simple command to follow me. It's as simple as that. He doesn't have to, he's saying, look, you promised to die for me. I, I'm telling you that's going to happen, but don't worry about that. Just follow me right now. What's interesting about the follow me command is it's the same command that Jesus uses with all of his disciples. You read through the rest of the gospels every time. It's like, you know, he meets somebody new and he's like, hey, Matthew, come follow me. Hey, come follow me. That's what he says to everybody. But there are two additional layers to notice here. So first, like I said, this is like a recommissioning. So in some sense, we're going back to square one with Peter. He's saying, follow me. Like, hey, I'm here. You're here. Follow me again. But what's really interesting about this, and a lot of commentaries point this out, is that this is not just like, hey, be a disciple again. Jesus is pointing out to him that there is an amplification of his mission that's going on here. As Jesus is about to leave, Peter is not just being called back into discipleship or what we would even call apostleship, where there was you know, 12 or 13 of those guys in the first century. He's being called into a leadership position even in that context. Uh, J. Ramsey Michaels puts it this way in the New International Commentary on the New Testament. Follow me is, of course, the imperative for every disciple, but Jesus is called, or Peter is called to follow Jesus specifically as shepherd of the flock with all that that entails. So as, as Jesus is leaving, that's why we're talking about Peter's death, <laughs> because Jesus said the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And Peter is now going to be one of the big shepherds, and he's going to be laying down his life figuratively for the sheep, but then ultimately he will lay his life physically down for the sheep. What I want to also point out about this is that reconciliation wasn't just for Peter. Yes, Jesus is meeting Peter. He's meeting Peter at a charcoal fire to help him with his grief and with his sadness, to help him with his doubts and his loss and all those things. He's reconciling with Peter personally. But the point is not that Jesus reaches out to Peter so that Peter can go be a monk and just pray nicely for the rest of his life, right? He's calling Peter into responsibility, and that responsibility always comes in the context of community. And so when we, when we think about reconciliation, even our reconciliation with God, our reconciliation with Christ, it's not just that Jesus left the 99 to find us the one lost sheep. That's true. It is true that Jesus left the 99 to find us. That is absolutely true. But the point is, when the sheep comes back, where is he? He's with the other 99. Reconciliation, it has to include community. There's a community element to reconciliation. There's always a community element to reconciliation. So let's sum up with what we talked about today. Uh, we see Peter and some of the other disciples, they've, they've gone fishing. Peter, in particular, is scarred by his past, by the promises that he didn't fulfill. He, you know, he's the first one that walks on the water. He's the only one that walks on the water. Uh, he's the one who proclaimed Jesus as Messiah first. Uh, but he was also the one who said he would die for Jesus and then denied him instead, right? So what could possibly heal this wound? Or perhaps more accurately, who could possibly heal this wound? There's only one answer. Jesus. He's the only one who can heal this wound. So this resurrection appearance of Jesus shows us the importance of reconciliation. There's only one successful path forward for Peter, and that path involves forgiveness, healing, restoration, and reconciliation with his Lord, Jesus. So Jesus, you know, you can imagine all the things that he could be doing, you know, all the things that, you know, you might think are more important than sitting down with Peter at a charcoal fire and cooking up some fish in the morning. But what he does is he takes time. He takes his time to reconcile with Peter. And in this moment, Jesus is not just reconciling with Peter. He's calling him into an even greater calling. And that calling ultimately involves a ton of other people. The impact is far beyond Peter. Every person that Peter now touches because he's been reconciled, is being reconciled in this moment too. So just as the death of Jesus has changed forever the way that he will relate with his disciples, how they viewed the world, so too resurrection changes everything. The resurrection of Jesus changed Peter's life and his ministry. Peter goes from a failed disciple, 
of a failed Messiah to a recommissioned and reconciled leader of a movement dedicated to that crucified and resurrected king. Think about that for a second. <laughs> you go from being a failed disciple. You couldn't even be the right, like a good disciple. You couldn't even, all you have to do is just not deny him. Like that was the, the bar was set that low. Like all the other disciples just ran away. Like Peter follows along. I guess we could give him partial credit for that, but he denies him. He just, all you have to do is not deny him, but he's a failed disciple. And Jesus, because he dies, is, according to many first century Jews, a failed Messiah until the resurrection happens. When the resurrection happens and this encounter can take place, he can be recommissioned, reconciled, back where he belongs, leading this early Christian movement dedicated to the kind of king that would die on a cross and trust his father to be raised from the dead. So what does this mean for us today? We too want to be people of the resurrection, the people of hope. And one of the ways that we can actively participate in being the people of hope and the people of resurrection is by being people of reconciliation, people of forgiveness, people who restore relationships with others. And I want to be clear here that this is not always on us. Um, you know, imagine Jesus shows up and Peter just is like, look, man, I don't want to have this conversation. Like, or denies him again. Be like, look, I don't believe this is really you. I'm, you know, I've, I've moved on. You know, whoever you are, you're not Jesus. I've moved on. <laughs> I don't think it would have ended up in the Gospel of John, that interaction, <laughs> personally, <laughs> probably. The story would have been quite a little bit different. So sometimes reconciliation seems impossible. And that's why I formatted the title of the sermon the way I did. It's like mission impossible, mission reconciliation. What I'm suggesting here is that the leading of the Spirit and the way of Jesus is to reconcile and to restore when we can, when it's in the power of us to do so. And of course, the greatest reconciliation that we can offer to people is the same reconciliation that Jesus offered to Peter, which is reconciliation with him, reconciliation with our Father. So when we reach out to people with the gospel message, that is reconciling them to God through Christ. That is what that means. So this morning, some of us may be dealing with shame. Some of us may be fighting battles that we don't want other people to know about. Some of us may be struggling with apathy towards our faith. Uh, some of us may be dealing with traumas in our past, traumas in our present, uh, difficulties. Uh, some of us may feel like we're stuck in a rut. But I want to reiterate to you this morning that there is grace and there is forgiveness found in Jesus. And no matter where we are, whether we're fishing in a boat in Galilee or whether we're just going about our business here in Louisville, Kentucky 2,000 years later, God is seeking us out in his love. He's always seeking us out in his love. So the first step for us this morning is to accept the forgiveness and the reconciliation that has been given to us. Once we've recognized that we have been forgiven, we've been reconciled, then we too must forgive and seek to reconcile with others. Now, this can be a process that takes time. After all, Jesus didn't immediately reconcile with Peter the moment he gets up from the grave. <laughs> There are other appearances where Peter was there and Jesus doesn't have that conversation with him right then. It took time. And I imagine that even for Peter in the wake of this conversation, I'm not convinced Peter was just okay after this conversation took place. I know I wasn't okay even with my friends and I just failed to take them to the airport and they still got to the airport on time. Like how big could my guilt have actually been? Like I really wasn't that guilty. I mean, what Peter did was way worse, and I still had a hard time moving on from what I did. Can you imagine? I can imagine that Peter still would have had a hard time dealing with that, even with what Jesus does here. So what I'm pointing out is this takes time. It's not immediate. But, again, we can make progress with the help of the Spirit. We can make progress with the help of those, those around us in Christian community. And we've been called to be the people of hope and the people of the resurrection. And one powerful way that we can do that is by reconciliation. Let's pray. Father, we're just so thankful for the reconciliation and the forgiveness that is available through Christ. It's unbelievable the steps and the, 
the things that your son and our Lord has, has done and did for someone like Peter, and just the impact that we can see um, for, even for our lives. Uh, the things that Peter did after this, Father, the wonderful things that you worked through him changed the course of history to where we can be here so many years later uh, worshiping you still. So, Father, we're just so thankful for how you're a God of love and a God of reconciliation, a God of forgiveness, and that uh, we're never too far from you, uh, that you're closer than our very breath, and that you pursue us um, even when we're not looking. So help us to be people that reconcile others. Help us to, um, to see the resurrection power in reconciliation. Help us to... Um, to bring those back to you through the gospel message. Uh, help, help us be the people that can heal people of their past trauma and their guilt and things that they've been through. Such a great calling that you've given us, Father. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.